Good morning, everyone. I make that uh, the morning, early in the morning, you didn't have much to do than other than uh, watching my very boring uh, interview on Arirang TV. Uh, nice way of killing time. Um, as uh, introduced by are this, this is on and off. I, I, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, I am a retired Korean uh, foreign service officer. Uh, my last posting was uh, in New York as a Korean ambassador to the South Korean ambassador, of, not North Korea, South Korean ambassador to the United Nations for a little over three years. But altogether, I was posted in New, in New York, a Korean mission to the UN, uh, four times. So I spent more than 10 years uh, dealing with the United Nations and doing what is called uh, multilateral diplomacy. So that's probably why I'm here. And I'm now teaching, actually. I'm a professor, not this university, but at another university called Kyunghee University. I understand you guys are all enrolled here in Korea University. Um, so I'm teaching right now uh, at, at, uh, at actually at two uh, schools, uh, Kyunghee University and the other one is uh, called the KDI School, Korea Development Institute School down in Sejong City. So I take train to go down. Um, even at my schools, I mostly teach on the United Nations or global issues that are being dealt with in the United Nations. So naturally, um, today I like to give you a little uh, lecture, about 40 minutes, uh, on uh, Korea and the United Nations. When you think of the United Nations, what first comes to your mind? I, I guess one way or another, all of you must have heard about the UN, at least if not studied on the UN. Uh, some of you must have uh, studied a lot on the United Nations and other international organizations. Um, others might not have uh, had that kind of experience, but you know, you must have heard about the UN either on news, TV news, or on newspaper, uh, or on CNN, uh, where CNN doesn't carry too much on uh, UN. But anyway, some of you might think of the UN headquarters building in the United Nations. How many of you have actually been there? Would you raise your hands? Oh, quite a few. Thank you. Uh, it is in the eastern part of uh, Manhattan, uh, Midtown Manhattan, actually. And uh, this building is uh, the Secretariat building, where uh, about 7,000 people work, and headed by the UN Secretary General. The UN Secretary General was, uh, uh, I don't know if you know him, a Korean until last year, Mr. Ban Ki-moon. And his office is on the top floor of this building, on 38th floor. So in the United Nations, if someone tells you that you are, you are called, by, called to 38th floor, that means Secretary General wants you. Um, but the diplomats of all the UN member states how many member states are there? Do you know? 193. And do you know which one is the most recent member state that joined the UN? No idea? Ever heard about a country called South Sudan? South Sudan is the latest addition to the UN membership. And as you can see, there are a lot of flags 
actually 193 of them. How do I know? I counted. No, uh, joking. Uh, because there are 193 member states. So every morning, UN guards raise them and pull them down in the evening. I don't know why they do that. You know, they can just leave them alone, but they raise it in the morning and pull them down in the evening. Quite a work, actually. But the place where member states, representatives, ambassadors of member states have their meetings is not here. It's, uh, this photo doesn't sh show it. It's uh, somewhere here. There is a, a dome-shaped building uh, where they have this room. This room is called General Assembly Hall. As you can see, a lot of people are there, probably because it, is, it was taken in September. In September, they start a new session. Session goes on for one year, and then every September, the previous session ends, and the new session starts. So I think there is a head of state speaking there right now. How do I know? Because the podium is full, and on the podium, the gentleman sitting, or, or gentlewoman sitting, in, in the middle, in the center, is President of General Assembly. And the one who is sitting next to him is usually the Secretary General of the United Nations. And this room looks exactly the same as when I first entered it in 1985. So 32 years ago. How come it looks exactly the same? The UN had a major renovation called the Capital Master Plan, costing $2 billion in three years. Uh, but they did it exactly the same way it looked in the beginning. Except one thing. Can you find uh, one thing that was not there in 1950? Huh? What was that? The screens, you know, LCD TV screen was not there in 1950. So that's the addition to this room. Some of you might think of the Security Council. You know, Security Council is probably the most important and most powerful, if not most important, definitely most powerful organ in the United Nations, even more powerful than the General Assembly. Because according to Charter, the Security Council can make decisions that are binding on member states. If you are a student of international law, you would already understand that states, sovereign states, are not bound by anything to which they didn't agree, right? Article 25 of the UN Charter says, when you join the United Nations membership, you promise to carry out decisions by the Security Council. This is quite a big compromise on your sovereign power because you don't know what kind of decisions they will make and you just promise to carry them out. So Security Council is the most powerful organ in the UN. And I know this photo was taken in December 2014. How do I know? Because I'm sitting there. Why am I sitting there? Because South Korea was a member of the Security Council for two years. It's not easy to become a member of the Security Council because membership is only 15, and five of them are permanent. So they always sit there. So there are only 10 states that can be taken by other member states 188 member states through election. And you need to get two-thirds majority votes if you want to get elected. So in the UN membership, there are at least 40, over 40 countries that have never been a member of the Security Council during the last 72 years. So that shows how it is difficult to get elected to 
Security Council membership. South Korea have been sitting on the council twice during during five year uh, membership of the United Nations, and this was actually my last meeting Security Council because you have two year term on the council, so there should be last day. It was uh, December 22, and because they don't have any meeting in the UN during the Christmas break, that was the last meeting of Security Council, and we talked about North Korean human rights. And somehow, some people in Korea watched uh, the video clip of my speech. And some of you might think of this, blue helmet. What are blue helmets? Peacekeepers helmet, correct. Peacekeepers, they are fond of blue color. Actually, the UN is fond of blue color. Blue color is the UN's color. So they wear a blue helmets. But they can also wear blue berets. But anyway, helmet or berets, it is blue. So is the color of refugee uh, relief activities. What is UNHCR? UN High Commissioner for, what is R? Refugees. I gave you already the hint. So UNHCR is a High Commissioner for Refugees based in Geneva. And the, and the current UN Secretary General, Guterres, Mr. Guterres, the, the former Portuguese Prime Minister, was once High Commissioner for this body, refugees. So this gentleman is uh, taking care of uh, some materials to be delivered to refugees, part of their uh, humanitarian assistance. The United Nations came into being after the end of the Second World War. The Second World War, you know, both world wars took place in the first half of the 20th century. So a lot of people, as of uh, 1945, if you are uh, older, than, older than 30 years of age, then you must have experienced the two biggest wars in human history during your lifetime. What an what are unlucky person, right? You know, two greatest wars in human history took place in your lifetime. F for the adults who lived in 1945. And the two wars put together cost 85 million lives. If you think about the population, world population that time, which must have been about a quarter of the current population, the casualties were enormous. The Second World War ended with the use of nuclear bomb. The bomb dropped on Hiroshima, killed 70,000 people instantly, and 70,000 more in the aftermath. Watching this, after experiencing two greatest wars in, in history during his or her lifetime, people living in the world of 1945 thought, if we are going to have another war, there might not be a future for humanity. So that's how the leaders of the world gathered in San Francisco in 1945, in June 1945, they signed the United Nations Charter. The United Nations was created, you know, the first line of the UN Charter clearly says why they are creating the UN. What do they say? We, the peoples of the United Nations, 
determined to save succeeding generations from the scourge of war, which twice in our lifetime has brought untold sorrow to mankind. So they are clearly saying why they are creating the United Nations. But still, the United Nations has three pillars, peace, development, and human rights. So if they created the UN to prevent another war, to maintain peace and security, why do they need the other two pillars, development and human rights? I think the founding fathers of the United Nations uh, were very uh, wise and visionary because they learned the lessons from the two wars. The, uh, you, you probably heard about the uh, difficult time, for example, Germans went through after the end of the First World War because uh, they had to pay uh, a lot of uh, pay a, a lot of money as compensation to the uh, victors of the First World War, like United Kingdom or France. So, so the German economy was uh, really in bad shape, no matter how hard the Germans worked. And when Hitler came up, and Hitler uh, argued uh, that, you know, the, we Germans, we are great people, we should not be suffering forever, not only us, our next generation are suffering, because we lost a war. So, so Hitler promised that he will revive German glory, which appealed to people, because people were so poor, so much suffering from poverty and lack of human dignity. So they realize that if you want to keep peace, if you want to prevent another war, you should give people decent life. You should give, feed people properly, and you should secure their human dignity by promoting human rights. That's how the United Nations is based on three pillars instead of one pillar, even though they created the UN to maintain peace. Let's uh, briefly uh, uh, run down on, the, uh, on how the Korean Peninsula issues have been dealt with in the United Nations. As you know, the Korea got its independence in 1945, Korea was a colony of Japan for 35 years. And of course, as you know, Japan lost the Second World War, like Germany. And the victors of the war, the United States and the Soviet Union, now Russia, they came into the Korean Peninsula. The northern part of Korean Peninsula, uh, the Soviet Union uh, established a military administration there. And in the southern part, uh, the United States uh, started military administration for three years. But in 1948, there was an election. And uh, in South Korea, uh, we accepted uh, supervision by the United Nations over our election, and a new government, Korean, South Korean government, came into being, which was endorsed by the United Nations. But North Korea, in, in the northern part of the peninsula, they didn't like uh, the engagement by United Nations, so they rejected uh, the offer to supervise the election there, but they established their own republic, 
which was called Democratic People's Republic of Korea, or DPRK. Two years later, there was a war. This war, the Korean War, which came about only five years after the establishment of the United Nations, was probably the biggest real challenge to international peace and security the United Nations faced for the first time in its existence. Because it's only five years after the creation of the UN, and as, you, as, we, as we looked at, as we looked at it, the UN was created to prevent another war. And this was a major war that occurred five years after, the, after 1945. There had been a few other small-scale conflicts, like in the Middle East, in Palestine. But this was the first major war in the context of the Cold War, because it involved not only the two Koreas on the peninsula, but the United States, China, and in a way, Soviet Union. So the Security Council authorized a unified command to fight the armed attack from North Korea, and they authorized the use of a UN flag. If you are a student of the United Nations, you might have been faced with some question like, what kind of uh, peace operation this was. Because originally, according to the UN Charter, the United Nations was going to have an army. But that was never realized. That is not realized even today. The United Nations doesn't have an army. So instead, the UN uh, resort to kind of new invention called peacekeeping operations. But peacekeeping operations are mostly about observing ceasefire, not peace enforcement like this. For the, for the purpose of peace enforcement, later, after 1990s, the United Nations resort to what is called multinational forces. So the Security Council authorized member states to mobilize their troops to enforce peace, which is not in accordance with the original idea of the UN Charter. But because there is no UN army, that's the only way for the UN to maintain peace or enforce peace. This was probably the original model of that. But that time, in 1950, because there was no such model, you know, they had argument about, is this really uh, UN's collective security measure as embodied in the UN Charter. So there was this legal argument, but I think 40 years later, uh, the argument was settled. Anyway, the Korean question was uh, put, put on the agenda of the General Assembly as well uh, in 1950, and every year, the Allied friends of uh, South Korea uh, submitted a General Assembly resolution that was always passed. And then, in 1960s and 70s, a uh, lot of new independent countries joined the United Nations. The original members of the United Nations in 1945 were 51. These 51 countries were mostly either European or American, Latin, including Latin America. There, was, there were not too many countries in Africa or Asia. Most of them were still colonies. But they got independence in 50s, 60s, and 70s. So they joined the UN membership, and UN membership grew uh, dramatically. And some of them formed what is called non-aligned movement, meaning they are not taking side either with the United States or Soviet Union. And some of and the, 
because North Korea joined the non-aligned movement, some NAM countries uh, supported North Korea. And they started to submit their own resolution supporting North Korea's position. And in 1975, something funny happened because the two resolutions submitted by Friends of South Korea and Friends of North Korea, both of them were adopted. And these two resolutions had conflicting contents. One of them was uh, expressing support for UN command in South Korea. The other one was uh, asking for withdrawal of the UN command. So you cannot obviously implement both of them. So the UN realized that you know, the United Nations authority will be greatly undermined if they continue to take decisions that are conflicting with each other, right? So they decided to take the issue off the UN General Assembly agenda in 1976. And then, until 1991, um, the, the uh, competition between South Korea and North Korea in the UN was mostly about the issue of admission to the United Nations. South Korea, we thought that we should become a UN member like any other country. But North Korea argued that we should wait, wait until unification. We should become a UN member as one nation. That was North Korea's position. And in the Security Council, there are friends of North Korea like China and Soviet Union. So these countries, um, vetoed South Korea's admission. So neither Korea became a UN member until 1991, because in 1990, the Cold War ended, and South Korea established uh, diplomatic ties with uh, Soviet Union, Russia, followed by China. So they, these countries decided not to oppose South Korean admission any longer. And then North Korea changed its mind, so both Koreas became UN members in September 1991. This photo was taken that time in front of the uh, UN gate. I was there, not in the photo, but behind the camera. I was quite young, uh, 1991, obviously I was younger than now. And these gentlemen uh, standing, posing there, are from South Korea, including South Korean foreign minister, ambassadors, uh, member of parliament. And I still remember, it was a quite warm and sultry day, you know. In New York City, you have what is called Indian summer, right? So even it was in September, it was quite warm, quite hot. And I was watching the two flags going up. Not only two, actually seven flags were going off because there were some uh, Baltic countries that got independence from Soviet Union and became UN members along with us. And somehow, outside the war, there were a lot of shouting, shouting from Korean Americans living in New York. And they were shouting like, Korea is one. Korea is one. What does it mean? Korea is one. So you guys shouldn't become UN members separately. You should wait until unification. In the same line as uh, the original North Korean position, right? So I, I thought, what a shame. You know, we've been waiting for this moment for many, many years. And, and the, these are Korean Americans and they are you know, uh, shouting in demonstration. So I thought, what a shame. But I thought, you know, watching the two flags going up, South Korea's and North Korea's, I thought, probably before my retirement as a diplomat, those two flags will merge into one. But I got retired the last January. The two flags are still there. But I 
not, I, I still hold on to the dream. It, they will merge uh, during my lifetime, I hope. Today, uh, in the UN, there is no South Korean issue. So Korean Peninsula issues in the UN are mostly North Korean issues. There are three important North Korean issues. DPRK, nuclear issue, DPRK, human rights issue, and humanitarian assistance to DPRK. Nuclear issue, it takes uh, quite a time if I go into detail, but, but I will just give you a rundown on what is happening and what is, uh, what is at stake. Um, there have been six nuclear tests by North Korea so far. And I think because you are a student of international relations, I think you must have heard about NPT, Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, which was signed in 1967 and came into effect in 1970. This treaty provides that all the countries in the world would promise not to possess nuclear weapons, and in return for that, they would be given technology for peaceful use of nuclear energy. But in 1967, there were already five countries that possessed nuclear weapons. They are the United States, United Kingdom, France, Russia, and China. These countries were kind of allowed to keep nuclear weapons, but they promised nuclear disarmament. But what exactly nuclear disarmament meant was not too clear. Does it mean that they will go down to zero nuclear weapon? Or does it mean that they will go for a reduction in their nuclear arsenal? Actually, what happened after that was the latter. They reduced number of nuclear weapons they possess. At the peak, both United States and Russia had over 30,000 nuclear warheads each. But by now, they must have about half of them. Half of them are enough to destroy the whole world 10 times. But anyway, they went down. But they didn't get rid of nuclear weapons. So if you think, well, disarmament means zero nuclear weapons. So they didn't promise. They, they, they didn't keep their promise. Then you're right. They didn't keep their promise. But if you think at least they reduced nuclear weapons, then you're also right. Anyway, what is more important is non-proliferation. What is more important is the fact that all other countries in the world promised not to have nuclear weapons. And because they promised, they got nuclear technology. Nuclear technology is the same both for weaponization and peaceful use. You know, you have uranium and you enrich uranium to get concentrate U-235. That's what is called the enrichment. You keep enriching, you get 20% U-235, that's for fuel. You get 80% of U-235, that's for bomb. Same technology. You just keep doing it. So, they uh, controlled uh, spread of nuclear technology through NPT. That's how South Korea got our nuclear energy, and we have uh, more than 20 nuclear power plants. That's how North Korea got technology. They don't have nuclear power plants, but they have a small research reactor in a place called the Yangbyon, which they imported from the Soviet Union during the Cold War. They were able to import it because they promised, promised not to develop nuclear weapons. That's the only way of getting 
nuclear technology. But in 1993, they uh, announced that they would no longer stay in the NPT. They would no longer be bound by the promise. They will, that means they, will, they, they might develop nuclear weapons. Is that a fair deal? You got your technology because you promised not to have nuclear weapons and you change your mind and we decide to go for nuclear weapons. That's what happened. And there have been ups and downs. There have been some agreements in 2005, but one year later, uh, North Korea went for the first round of nuclear bomb test in 2006. And after that, they had nuclear bomb tests almost exactly every three years. And then last year, they had two tests. This year, they had one. So if you think, if you consider that you know, countries like India, Pakistan, and Israel, three countries did not join the NPT. They are the only three countries in the world that did not sign the NPT. Why, the, why they did not do that? Because they wanted to develop nuclear weapons, which is uh, worrisome, but which, is, which doesn't constitute violation of anything because they did not join the NPT. Both India and Pakistan conducted four to five rounds of nuclear test, bomb test, in 1998. So we assume if these countries succeeded in developing nuclear bomb in 1998 through five to four to five rounds of test, North Korea by now, much later, having conducted six rounds of test, they must have got the same capability. The reason why countries keep, countries going for rounds of bomb test is to miniaturize them, miniaturize bomb, make it small and light so that you can mount it on a missile. In 1945, when United States dropped bomb in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, they used, used their airplane, bomber. They were able to do that because they were controlling the sky. No, nobody's going to shoot it down, shoot down their bombers. But now, you cannot do that. Maybe United States can do that. They have a very nice bomber, you know, flying very high, fast, and even stealth. So United States can still, might still use bombers to use nuclear weapons, but no other country can do that. If you carry your nuclear bomb in an airplane, nuclear bomb is very expensive, and if someone else shoot it down, you know, you, you just did very stupid thing. So you should be able to mount nuclear bomb on a missile. If you want to mount a bomb on a missile, you should be able to make it light and small, which is called miniaturizing. So that's why these countries take five to six rounds of bomb test to make them small. So probably North Koreans got it now. They conducted uh, six rounds of tests, as you can see, and we notice it through seismic activity, you know, seismic, like earthquake. And the most recent one in September this year was a 6.3 degree magnitude. And the previous one was 5.3 degree magnitude. You might say, oh, just one degree higher. Actually, in seismic uh, gauge, one degree means 10 times. So the September one this year was 10 times stronger than the last year's test. Every time the UN responded with uh, Security Council resolutions, strengthening the sanctions against North Korea. I think the, probably the first three resolutions uh, carried uh, not very strong uh, 
sanctions. Probably they still hold, held on to the hope that North Korea will turn around. North Korea will stop, freeze, freeze their nuclear development. But the more recent ones, you know, at least uh, the ones uh, in 2016 when I was still UN ambassador, and the one this year, 2375, these resolutions contain very strong uh, sanctions. You know, sanctions before uh, this year was like this, you know, complete arms embargo, expulsion of DPRK diplomats, mandatory inspection of all cargo to and from DPRK, shutdown of DPRK banks abroad, ban on DPRK's import of aviation fuel. But the sanctions added this year are really tough because, especially this one, you know, total ban on DPRK's largest export, including coal, seafood, and textile, which will reduce its foreign export by 70 to 90 percent. North Korea does not export much. North Korea's annual export volume stands around $3 billion. South Korea's annual export is about $600 billion. So North Korea's export is only one two hundredth of South Korea's. But still, if your export is cut down by 90%, I don't know which countries you are from, but your countries cannot survive if you cannot export 90% of what you are exporting. Can you? In South Korea, if, we, if that is uh, applied to us, we will not survive a year. There will be riots on the street. You know, we, we live on our export. Many of you also live on your export. So if your export is banned, you know, 90% of your export is banned, you cannot survive. But North Korea can. How? Because North Korea is so little dependent on its trade with the outside world. Even so, I think these sanctions will take effect when North Korea is done with nuclear and missile tests and they, they decide to turn around when they decide to go for economic development. Because these sanctions virtually mean that all North Korea's economic activities with the outside world are banned. Under these sanctions, no country can pursue economic development. They might be able to survive for a while. So waiting out North Korea, waiting until these, take, these sanctions take effect, this policy was called by President Obama strategic patience, which President Trump hates. The second North Korean issue is DPRK, human rights issue. The situation in North Korea, uh, North Korea, human rights situation in North Korea was already bad, but it didn't came to the attention of the international community until early 2000 because the country, the society in North Korea is so closed, so not too many people outside North Korea knows what is happening there. There were rumors and organization like Amnesty International uh, worked on these speculation or rumors and they argued that there are concentration camps in North Korea and there are human rights violations, even as early as in the 1980s. But the, they did not have witness, they did not have testimonies until late 1990s when North Korean defectors started to come out. So these people coming out from North Korea uh, made their testimony that, you know, my friends, even myself, were prisoned, tortured, 
or spend time in camp, political prisoners camp. So, th so now everyone clearly understand there was human rights violations going on in North Korea. And that's how the issue came into the UN in 2003, Human Rights Council in Geneva, and 2005, General Assembly. The debate on North Korean human rights entered into a new dimension thanks to this gentleman. This gentleman's name is Michael Kirby, the former justice from Australia, and he headed three-person committee uh, doing thorough investigation on North Korean human rights situation, interviewing more than 200 North Korean defectors, and he came up with this report, which he is holding proudly. This is probably the most thorough and comprehensive report ever written on North Korean human rights situation. And the importance of this uh, report is that they concluded that human rights violations in North Korea constituted crimes against humanity. Crimes against humanity is not rhetoric. It's a legal term which qualifies for international criminal court process. So they, the General Assembly recommended this issue encourages the Security Council to consider because now it is qualified for you know, international criminal court uh, mandate. This is how you know, I, I spoke, I participated in the last meeting of my uh, Security Council term and we had debate on North Korean human rights and every December after that, last year and the year before, they had the uh, same debate in the Security Council, and probably this year they will do, do it again. And if you consider that the Security Council is not actually a forum in the UN to discuss human rights. Human rights are usually being dealt with in the General Assembly and the Human Rights Council. Security Council only does that when human rights violation is so serious that it poses, uh, it, it becomes a threat to peace. There have been only three such cases, including North Korea. The third issue concerning North Korea in the UN is uh, humanitarian assistance to the DPRK. In the UN, they have departments uh, for humanitarian assistance, and it's called OHCR. Um, and uh, this department plans every year, kind of estimate for need for humanitarian assistance, because humanitarian assistance is given to countries and people who are in humanitarian crisis. So when you have crisis, you need to provide assistance immediately. So that's why you need to estimate how much money you would need this year to respond to such crisis. They do it individually for countries that are vulnerable to humanitarian crisis. And North Korea is one of them. They are vulnerable to humanitarian crisis because sometimes they have, uh, they have a poor harvest, people are starving. Sometimes they have uh, flooding and they don't have uh, infrastructure to deal with flooding. So usually in the past, the UN came up with about $100 million for DPRK, which uh, is a, a, an estimated amount uh, that would be probably required by humanitarian crisis in North Korea. But after the nuclear issue, donors, donors are mostly in Europe and developed countries, so donors are reluctant to provide humanitarian assistance. So the 
100 million dollars never been collected after the nuclear issue. And every year, as you can see, uh, the, the amount of uh, assistance uh, given to DPRK for humanitarian need uh, is kind of going down. And in 2016, it stood at $44 million. And South Korea became number one donor by default, actually, because other countries are not willing to provide money. So South Korea became number one donor in the UN in humanitarian assistance to North Korea three years. But, in, but last year, the government decided not to pro provide uh, assistance, humanitarian assistance, which, in my opinion, was a, a mistake. You, know? you need to provide humanitarian assistance no matter what kind of political situation you have. Because even during a war, you know, red, organization like Red Cross, they, they help people who are in humanitarian need. So I think humanitarian assistance should continue. I th probably it will continue this year. There are, of course, other issues in the UN. I will just briefly uh, run down on them. And I will just mention two issues, sustainable development and climate change. Sustainable development, probably you heard about it. Uh, sustainable development goals. There are 17 goals which replaced eight MDGs. What is MDG? Millennium Development Goals. They came into being in the year 2000 and were applied for 15 years until, nine, until 2015. So from 2016, they have new goals, a set of goals, 17 of them, that are going to be applied for the next 15 years, until 2030. If you ask me, why do they do that by 15 years, instead of 10 years or 20 years? I don't know. They just decided to do that 15 years, so they stick to 15 years. So these goals are, have a 15 year uh, term. And as you can see here, you know, uh, we have a uh, lot of problems coming from or exacerbated by globalization, you know, such as growing inequality. Um, and the, in the United Nations, the Sustainable Development Goals is contained in a document called 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, and it has emphasis on the marginalized and vulnerable, under the model of leaving no one behind. So if you take care of those who are furthest behind, then you can take care of the whole society. That's the concept of leaving no one behind. There are 17 goals, which is uh, twice as many as MDGs. So some people ask questions, you know, why do you have so many goals? If you have that many goals, you cannot concentrate, which is true, but the advantage of these uh, 17 goals is that you have a very comprehensive picture about what kind of goals we need to pursue in making the world better, in helping people in the world survive and deal with issues coming from globalization. So you don't have to worry about whether we are missing anything, you know, because these are so comprehensive, sometimes so ambitious. You know, for example, goal number one is uh, no poverty by 2030. So World Bank uh, President, Mr. Jim Yong Kim, once asked me, when I was ECOSOC President, ECOSOC is Economy and Social Council, once asked me, Ambassador, is this a development goal or political statement? Because you are saying that you will achieve 
zero poverty by 2030, is it possible? Probably not. How can you make zero poverty by 2030? But having an ambitious goal, you know, makes you work hard to make progress towards that goal. Even if that's too ambitious, even if you might not be able to get it. By the way, how do you define poverty? Who are the people who are poor? There is what is called the poverty line. Poverty line used to be those who are living with less than one dollar a day. But they upgraded it, they changed it to $1.25 a day about 10 years ago. And a couple of years ago, they changed it again. Now poverty line is $1.9 a day. So if you live on $1.9 a day, less than that, you are below the poverty line. You know, even $1.9 is $2 a day. That means $60 a month, you know. It's not your pocket money. We are talking about money you live on. You live on $60 a day. And there are at least 2 billion people in the world who are living with less than $2 a day. That's reality. That's why we need sustainable development goals. Um, when South Korea, when we participated in the negotiation to work out SDGs, uh, I was actually uh, president of ECOS at that time, Economic and Social Council. And we placed emphasis, focus on issues like health, education, rule of law, governance, gender equality, and development effectiveness. I don't have time to go into details about them. Just, I will just uh, uh, run down. You know, the, the last one is climate change. The photo on the left is the one I took when I visited a Norwegian island called Svalbard about eight years ago. Svalbard is very much in the north, very close to North Pole. It's, uh, the latitude is very high, uh, like 80 degrees, 80 north. And, and I went there in August, in summer, but as you can see, they still have a lot of ice, what is called permafrost. I can see some of you are chuckling. Are you from Norway? Ah, that's why you are chuckling. Okay, and you know, it was in August, the, the temperature was uh, around zero, between zero and five Celsius. So if you are from tropical country, it's quite chilly, right? But these people thought it's a very warm day, so they were wearing shorts. Anyway, you still have uh, ice there in August, but the head of the scientific center there told me that ice is melting in Arctic region very fast, twice as fast as the average temperature rise in the world. They don't exactly know why it is happening there. But if that continues, he said probably within 30 years there will be a summer when there is no ice in the Arctic. You know, Arctic is a sea, right? Unlike uh, Antarctica. Antarctica is land, Arctic is sea. There, there will be a summer when there is no ice in 30 years, within 30 years. But now the prediction is that within 10 years, there might be a summer when there is no ice in the Arctic Sea. If there is no ice in the Arctic Sea, there is only one benefit you can get from it. We have a shorter sea lane from East Asia to Europe, but that's probably the only benefit. We have all kinds of other problems like sea, uh, sea level rise, uh, changing sea current, you know, changing climate. 
And this guy is in big trouble, you know, polar bear, because polar bear hunts everything that moves. So in this village, they allow people to carry their rifles because they might run into polar bear, and you need to shoot it because polar bear attacks everything that moves and eat them. So if you don't want to become food for polar bear, then you better deal with it. And he can do that, he or she can do that, because he has white fur color, you know, perfect disguise. So he can approach animals or whatever it is he's trying to eat. But if there is no ice, what happens to him? He stands out, right? So that's why he looks so gloomy, you know. He is thinking about what he can do about uh, hunting, you know. So there was Paris Agreement uh, last year, in December last year, uh, no, no, two years ago, and this agreement, you know, I heard news yesterday that e even Syria ratified it. Syria was the last country that stayed out, so Syria ratified it, and the United States decided to uh, withdraw from Paris Agreement. So I think S Syria might have decided to join it to embarrass the United States so that the United States can be the only country outside Paris Agreement. But anyway, now we have all the countries. The, even the United States withdrawal has not been finalized. It takes three years to take procedure for withdrawal. So now we have all the countries in the world in this Paris Agreement. But Paris Agreement is composed of voluntary commitments made by all the states. So they need to implement their commitments, but some, some skeptics argue that even if all these commitments are implemented, carried out, they will not be able to stop temperature rise below two degrees Celsius compared to pre-industrial uh, era, in which case we are still in big trouble. Well, South Korea made our national, uh, you know, commitment. Uh, our commitment is 37% uh, uh, lower from the BAU. BAU is business as usual. Business as usual, the level uh, where if we don't do anything about it, you know, the level we would reach if we don't do anything about it. So South Korea's commitment is not very ambitious, but still, I think uh, there are less ambitious commitments than us as well. So I guess we are somewhere in the middle. The European Union's commitment is very ambitious. It's 40% uh, reduction from 1990 level, not BAU, 1990 level. So in 1990 is uh, like, uh, you know, 25 years ago, right? So it's uh, the carbon emission levels must have been quite low. So they promised to go down 40% lower than 1990 level. There have been eight UN Secretary Generals, except the current one, Guterres, and as you know, the eighth one was Korean, Mr. Ban Ki-moon. So we are proud of him, proud of his 10-year uh, activities, even though there might be people who, uh, who have different views on how, what kind of achievement he made. I think he made a lot of uh, progress in furthering the goals of the United Nations. Thank you very much. Thank you.